Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Brian Thatcher, and welcome to Mercy Unbound. It's a show and series that aims to provide hope and avenue for healing, and one that will help you understand and then live the great mercy of God. When we talk about the mercy of God as Eucharistic apostles of divine mercy, we think of the Eucharist, God's great love that he gives himself to us in the Eucharist. And I'm so happy today to have with us Brother Michael of the Blessed Sacrament Fathers. And we're going to talk about the founder of his order, Peter Julian Imard. Uh, he was ordained in 1834. And I've read his books, incredible writings on the Eucharist. And we're, we're going to ask Brother Michael to share some of his thoughts on the founder of his order, the works they're doing uh, in Cleveland. Uh, and just Brother's going to enlighten us uh, why he loves the Blessed Sacrament so much and how he got into the order. So welcome, uh, Brother Michael, and uh, welcome to Mercy Unbound. So happy to have you. Thank you for having me. Tell us, you know, what stands out in your mind about the founder of your order, and tell us a little bit about his life, if you would. Well, uh, his love for our Lord and the Blessed Sacrament from childhood to adulthood uh, throughout his whole life. Uh, he was born in uh, 1811 and he dies in 1868, so 57 years of age when he dies. But throughout his life as a child, uh, being raised by his parents, his mother had great devotion to the Blessed Sacrament. Then every afternoon at four o'clock, she would take him as a baby to the benediction. Uh, at the age of five years old, he did something very, very uh, odd. Uh, he ran out of the house into the church and sat on the table of the altar with his head leaning against the tabernacle. His sister, Mary Ann, found him. And she asked him, you know, what are you doing there? And he responded very uh, matter of factly, very, very uh, comfortably. Uh, I am near Jesus and I am listening to him. Mm -hmm. After all these years of my reading his life and other works, uh, I've come to realize that that was his whole life, close to Jesus and listening to him. Uh, he had, uh, in his day, he could receive communion only at the age of 12. At the age of eight, he would accompany his sister to mass and sitting next to her after she came back from the altar, uh, he would lean his head against her chest and he would tell her, Godmother, Godmother, I can feel his presence. I can feel his presence. Now, we can also say that, you know, well, he was a precocious child, but in reality, we know that uh, as a child, they are open to the spirit. And so uh, I have come to believe, as others likewise, that uh, Father Amart was formed by our Lord and the Blessed Sacrament, because uh, he then, as a young uh, teenager, 1829, he enters the Oblates of Mary, Immaculate Missionary Order. And at the time that he enters, the novitiate has to do an hour of reparation before the Blessed Sacrament because there was a desecration of the Blessed Sacrament in that city of Marseille. And so the founder, uh, the Mazanon, uh, he asked the novice master to have the Blessed Sacrament exposed for the purpose of reparation. So Father Reinhardt, many years later, tells us that that is where he learned about the adoration uh, when he was with the OMIs. Uh, he had to leave them because, unfortunately, he, re he uh, contracted uh, pleurisy. And in those days, all these illnesses meant uh, you were one foot to the grave. So he was sent home. 
he had a year of, rep, of uh, recuperation. And from that moment on, his sister who had taken care of him at that time as a young boy, a young teenager, she always kept her eye watching him closely. So uh, there was a very uh, close relationship of brother and sister. Also, she being his godmother, Father Amard celebrated his baptism, which was on the 5th of February. Uh, he celebrated that much more than his birthday on the 4th of February. So that's how he celebrated that sacrament. Uh, the Eucharist is uh, also a present when he enters the seminary to study and uh, he becomes uh, a uh, vicar, uh, uh, an assistant pastor in one parish and then later on he becomes uh, a diocesan pastor in another. Uh, so at that moment, uh, he was ordained in 1834 on July 20th. And uh, he, at that time, when he's assigned to that parish as an assistant, he immediately realizes that he will have to nourish his spiritual life in order to be able to feed his people. So he he was uh, seen by his parishioners, always going very early into the chapel, to the church to pray uh, before the Blessed Sacrament. Uh, he celebrated the Eucharist and then he would uh, go about visiting the sick and giving the uh, catechetical instructions to the children and the people. But this uh, great love for the Blessed Sacrament he makes a resolution in one of his retreats that uh, he will first nourish himself with the scripture and that he will uh, take upon himself the mantle of the Eucharistic Lord in his tabernacle. Uh, I have interpreted that to mean uh, the inner life, his inner life, the contemplative life, because Father Amart, uh, I'm convinced now after all these years that the Holy Spirit uh, formed the founders of the 19th century to be uh, active apostles. They're constantly going from pillar to post because they were rebuilding the church in France and the country. And so they had to be on their feet running back and forth but the contemplative life was interior. And so he always found time to be with the Lord. Uh, he believed uh, always that if we have a friend in town or we should always at least knock on the door and greet this friend. And so our Lord was very real to him. Uh, he believed that Jesus had given himself completely to him in the Eucharist and the Blessed Sacrament. And in a way, when he founded our congregation, it was Father Amard's way of thanking our Lord for our Lord giving himself to him by giving our Lord this community of priests and brothers and sisters who would be adorers, witnesses of his presence among us. That really is the um, basic. At what point, you mentioned about the oblates, uh, did he say, I'm going in this direction a little differently than the oblates of uh, Mary Immaculate? Uh, he, only as a novice, he was a novice. Okay. And so he, left because of the pleurisy. But at the time of the ordination, he went to a shrine of Our Lady for two day preparation for the first mass. And that shrine was under the auspices of the OMIs. And they, in a way, invited him back 
but some something uh, did not permit uh, him to enter. So he did not enter and again, he remained a diocesan until much later in 1839, he uh, meets the Marist fathers and he then joins them and will be a Marist priest for 17 years. And at that point, then he decides to start his own. And then at the end of the 17 years, uh, he had received this grace to found our congregation maybe five years prior, but he kept uh, putting it back and back and, and consulting and consulting. And finally, he writes the letter to a friend. He says, I have to leave quickly. Uh, to go and retreat in Paris because this grace, I feel that if I do not respond, I will have uh, been uh, at fault. So that's when he went into a 10 day retreat, 12 day retreat in May, which was during the Ascension period. And that's when then he establishes the congregation, yes. You know, when you were speaking, brother, about uh, the Eucharist and the focus, um, it reminded me of a, a quote years ago, a priest told me about, we work so hard and we give of ourselves, but yet we have to receive also, or we, or we run out of gas, so to speak. And <laughs> he talked to, he used it in a sense of the Eucharist, you know, we, we give a, a piece of ourselves, of Jesus to others, but eventually there's nothing there. And so we have to receive. And I had a quote from your website, uh, from your founder. He says, have a great love for Jesus and the divine sacrament of love. That is the divine oasis of the desert. It is the heavenly manna of the traveler. It is the holy ark. It's the life and paradise of love on earth. That's uh, beautiful, beautiful statement. Yes. Now you also talked about adoration, but how would you list or tell the people what really the charism or charisms of the order then? Is it what's well, the, uh, everything is Eucharist. And Eucharist takes uh, primarily the principal way that when I entered in 1963, we had three hours of adoration, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, and then at night, we would get up during the night. So our communities always had to have at least 22 members so that this continual adoration would be. Mm. Uh, with the uh, changes uh, of the church, and, and the founder was very, very, uh, very precise in this. The church tells us how to adore her Lord. And so, uh, with the renewal, uh, we now have one hour a day, and uh, but that is central to our lives. Uh, we have the uh, celebration of the Eucharist, and then we have an hour of adoration during the day. That's paramount. Uh, and the... Um, So that, that's one way. Another way that he wanted us to do was through writing. He stated anyone who has the gift to write books or the sermons or whatever, uh, that is another way of, of proclaiming the Eucharist. Uh, also, whoever is an artist uses that medium of art uh, to promote the glory of the Blessed Sacrament, uh, you know, of, uh, designing altars, uh, churches, uh, art for the church. So it's multi, multi uh, given. And Father Amard gave a beautiful um, description of our gifts and talents. He states that every soul knows its gift and its talents, and that is to be nurtured uh, because through that medium, they are able to do much.
So brother, the Eucharist is the focus of your life as it was the founders. Now you've been a brother for how long? Uh, we count from first profession 1966. And you're in Cleveland now. Is that what you would call your provincial headquarters or? That's correct. And um, so you received the Eucharist are, and you talked about uh, the parishes. Are, are any of your priests involved actually as associate pastors or they help yeah. out? Yeah, we, we have our own parish. We've had our parish, St. Paschal Balon, uh, since 1953. Wow, before I was born. <laughs> um, and do you, you know, we just celebrated the Feast of Corpus Christi in Cleveland. Uh, did you have any special celebrations there or? Uh, we did. We had a beautiful procession of the Blessed Sacrament around the the uh, the block and onto the campus proper uh, after the, the ten thirty mass on Sunday. And where is that parish uh, in Cleveland? Uh, in Highland Heights, Highland 50, Heights. Oh, fifty-three eighty four Wilson Mills. You could probably Google uh, Saint Pascal Balon. And then uh, and and go to the uh, to the website, and they usually have uh, on YouTube. You could look, you could see different activities. You talked about Marseille, France, and here we are. You're in Cleveland, in the states. Uh, what other countries is the order? In? Oh, we're in. We're all over. We're in uh, Africa. We're in uh, in the United Kingdom. We're in uh, Brazil. We're in, Latin, in South America, Latin America. Uh, we we spread out uh, in Holland. In Holland. You know, so we're we're all over. With the charism being the Eucharist, obviously that must have been what drew you to the order. Yes, yes. I uh, I in, I visited our church in New York, Saint Jean Baptiste, which was our founding church. Uh, our fathers came from uh, Canada, nineteen hundred, and. Uh, they built the church there, and uh, I visited the church in 1963, uh, June 30th. Uh, I was high school graduate. I had just graduated from high school. And uh, going in, uh, the Blessed Sacrament was always exposed, and it was like uh, very high up on the altar. So I saw it and I knelt before the Blessed Sacrament. And I noticed there at the time that we had six predues uh, covered with uh, two in red for the priests and then in green for the brothers. So that Sunday I saw these uh, six men kneeling there and that struck me and I said, if these men take this this time of the day and night to pray before this the Lord here, it must be very important and I would like to belong to that. So I left that church and I went around the corner to the rectory and uh, I spoke to them, to the superior there, if he would accept me as a brother. And then, and then the rest is history. I entered in August, August uh, 7th of so 1963. So that's 37, 57, 59 years ago. Yes. Wow. You I know, was the uh, ripe old age of 19. Yeah. I'm now the ripe old age of 78. <laughs> have you traveled outside or have you stayed in Cleveland? Uh, I've uh, in the continental United States. Uh, I 
I did, um, as a brother I entered, and at that time we were uh, keepers of the house. So many of us were designated uh, cooks, uh, house, uh, well, uh, working with cars. Uh, I was always at the door. I was in charge of the front door. And uh, with Vatican II then, uh, we began to be sent to the universities to study. So I was uh, blessed in, I wanted to be a nurse because at the time that I entered, we were about 250 members. And so uh, we had minor seminaries. So all these people would get sick. So I knew that I wanted to prepare to be a nurse. So I did study nurse. taking the courses in nursing. I was also taking courses in history and education. So my degrees are as a teacher. So I, uh, I did work eight years in the hospital studying nursing, but I also uh, taught high school at a great uh, amount of uh, adult education uh, for lay leadership formation for the Archdiocese of New York. Also, uh, through the ages of my congregation, the community, and also the diocese, I did a lot of mission appeals. So I did mission appeals roughly from uh, 90 or 87, actually 87 to about uh, 2015. So I had a broad scope of all going to diocesan, uh, diocesan churches and speaking to people, uh, collecting money for the, for the missions, uh, either diocesan missions or our own. So. Now, tell me, Father, uh, brother, it, is your order the only one that's specifically, you know, dedicated or cares about the Holy Eucharist? Uh, no, uh, we are unique in the sense of uh, in the uh, approbation in 1981 with the renewal, uh, the church states that Father Amart uh, introduced a new way, uh, a new way of life, of consecrated life. And I often wondered, well, what does that mean? It's essentially, that he placed the Eucharist at the center. And so it was a community that was going to be built where the Blessed Sacrament was central, one, and then everything falling from it. Uh, no, because you have, let's say, the, uh, the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament and the Incarnate Word here in Cleveland uh, and their teachers and adorers, uh, let's say Mother Catherine Drexel, Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament, again, teaching the main piece and adoration. Amard made it adoration and then everything flowing well, from it. Uh, that's the way I've interpreted all these years. You know, one of the quotes, again, from the website, um, becoming an apostle of the Eucharist, um, be the apostle of the divine Eucharist, like a flame which enlightens and warms like the angel of his heart who will go to proclaim him to those who don't know him and will encourage those who love him and are suffering. <clears throat> when I think of the church, you know, if, if Jesus isn't present in the Eucharist, I mean, in some ways, we're just like any other church, aren't we? Hmm. You know, yes, our, our, our purpose is that uh, he's always with us. Uh, he said it, I'll be with you till the end of time. Uh, he, it, it, chapter six of John's gospel is very, very rich. Uh, you know, uh, when he states, uh, the people are saying, well, you know, how can you say that you give us uh, your flesh to eat and your blood to drink? You're a young guy. And uh, uh, Moses uh, gave manna to our fathers and they died. And, and then he responds, well, I am the living bread uh, come down from heaven. And he who eats me and drinks, drinks my blood, 
you know, will have life eternal. Uh, so uh, he is present. He is present there. But they found it hard to believe them, didn't they? Just as we do now. I mean, they didn't understand it then, did they? No, because uh, you remember that many left him. And then he says to the apostles, well, are you going to leave me too? And they said, well, to whom shall we go? You, you know, we've left all things to follow you. So uh, in a way they said, well, you're stuck with us. <laughs> You know, we're entering this period, I think it kicked off on the Feast of Corpus Christi, but the Holy Fathers talked about this Eucharistic revival, a three-year period or so, and yes. uh, to help yes. emphasize the real presence and the gift of the Eucharist. That's kind of got to be exciting to you as a brother in this order. Yes, uh, and of course, we also have our, uh, the congregation is uh, assembling our Eucharistic theologians. Uh, I believe we may put out a, a Eucharistic catechism, uh, help towards the catechism. And actually, uh, the, the Father Amart's letters, uh, there are six volumes of his letters. And all his letters, uh, one of the questions that you asked uh, when you sent me the initial note was uh, uh, something dealing with, uh, you know, how do we tell people, you know, Christ is present and, and or how did he deal with the communions and or the confessions? Uh, Father Amart encouraged frequent daily communion and because uh, he saw it as uh, the divine physician healing. Uh, do, do not curtail your communions uh, because as often as you receive him, you become like him. Uh, uh, I, I was going to mention, uh, I'll throw this in because it, it is part of the whole catechesis. Uh, all saints, as you know, are, uh, and founders especially, uh, you can go to a text of scripture and say, oh, there he is or there she is. And Father Amart carried chapter six of John in his pocket. And uh, for him, uh, this whole aspect of the manna in the desert as you quoted, uh, Father Amart also was fond of stating, uh, of setting the world on fire because Christ has come to set the world on fire, the four corners. And so he spoke of that uh, through the Eucharist. And it, uh, his whole purpose was to bring all peoples to the feet of our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. It's been many years since I've read his works, but I do remember one quote of his, May thy Eucharistic kingdom come. And That's good. Uh, that, yes, that is our, uh, our, um, our word, our slogan. I, I forget. Mm -hmm. that. Yes, in Latin, advenia renum tuum eucharisticum. We, uh, in novitiate, we had it right outside our dining room. So our our uh, novice master said, now an easy way of remembering this Latin, uh, the Eucharistic kingdom come is always ready to eat. <laughs> so that's that's how we uh, we memorize that that those words. The it's, Eucharistic when kingdom. When we recognize Jesus in the Eucharist, you know. It's like the divine mercy image behind me. It's the same Jesus we're receiving. Uh, only the, I guess the veils or scales have fallen from our eyes when we look at the image. Um, now, didn't your founder have a love for uh, Ar the Archangel Raphael? Uh, he, he described uh, the Archangel Raphael in a letter. Uh, I believe if you were to Google uh, 
uh, Letters of Peter Julian Amard, Volume One. Uh, they were assembled, there are six volumes, and they were assembled by one of our sister's uh, servants. Uh, there, I believe it's letter 100. He uh, describes the Archangel Raphael as a model for the third order uh, of Mary, uh, because he was the renowned director of the Third Order Marist laity. Uh, so uh, he gave them uh, the Archangel as a model of the adorer and uh, yes. You know, when I think about mass and having Jesus there, uh, you know, I live in Tampa and, you know, our football team uh, professional, it can get 70,000 people, no problem at a football game. <laughs> yes. People really understood that Jesus is present at every mass. Uh, the doors should be knocking down and people should be overflowing. Yes. You know? Yes. Um, now, you're, if someone is interested or considering a religious order, um, they can Google the Blessed Sacrament Fathers or St. Peter Julian Amard, it's E-Y-M-A-R-D. Uh, and then, as you said, your uh, offices are in Cleveland. Uh, any other thoughts, brother, you'd like to leave with our people today about the Eucharist and what it means to you or any thoughts on the founder? Well, uh, our Lord is always with us. The, the, maybe one of his, uh, maybe something we could remind him is that he's always quiet. Everybody talks around him and he's the main person, but uh, he remains quiet, but he's always there. And uh, he answers uh, our prayers very differently than the way we think he should. Uh, you know, we pray to him, you know, please heal us. And, and we have the exact method of how this healing should take place. But he will heal us, but the way he sees that we need the healing. Uh, and he does take his time. He's He's not uh, boisterous and, and it's going to be done tomorrow morning. But uh, in his time, uh, one time I had uh, a retreat 40 days with the Jesuits. And, you know, it was wonderful every day, you know, conversation was going well. I return over here to my community and there's no, no sound. I realized that he wants our undivided attention. He, when he speaks, he likes to be heard and only he likes to hear himself speak to us. So we may, we could be more attentive. Father Amar tells us when we go to pray, simply sit there and speak to him as a we from one person to another uh, and to use our own words, we go with everybody else's prayers in our books, but he wants to hear us uh, speak, uh, just to sit there and, and listen to him and thank him for the gifts that he has given us. That's my- Attitude, of, uh, attitude of gratitude, I guess. Uh, yes. Well, brother, I want to thank you for joining me today on Mercy Unbound, Father, uh, brother, and uh, the priests there, the nuns, they're all part of the Blessed Sacrament Fathers, uh, founder, St. Peter Julian uh, Amard, and uh, Google them, look them up, they've got offices in Cleveland, and uh, especially in these next three years, uh, I want to really encourage people to study uh, St. Peter Julian Amard, and, uh, you know, check out the Blessed Sacrament Fathers, and uh, get close to the Eucharist. And uh, I hope you all enjoyed this show today of Mercy Unbound. Uh, share it with friends, subscribe, and uh, 
Brother, I look forward to having you back sometime on Mercy Unbound. And thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel for the video portion. The podcast can be heard at anchor.fm slash drbryan, B-R-Y-A-N, Thatcher, T-H-A-T-C-H-E-R, and on all the major podcast forums. I would love to speak at your church or conference, and please consider supporting our efforts to spread the truth to a hurting world. Thank you again. And for more information, go to the website at drbryanthatcher.com.